Good morning. So good to see everyone on this sunshiny day, right? This is awesome. We welcome those who join us online. And just to note that this is the last Sunday to register for our um, Around the Table Fellowship Meals. It's not too late. If you still wanted to do it today, we'll start making those, uh, uh, form, forming those groups this week. Also, in your folder, you'll see lots of announcements, but a key one would be this is the last week also to make a nomination for the Maple Site Pastor. If you have a suggestion, we'll be sending those in to the district. The rest of them are in the folder. Let our worship begin as we stand to sing our opening hymn. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 
We kneel or sit for confession. Let us confess our sins to God, our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake, God forgives us all our sins. To those who believe in Jesus Christ, he gives the power to become the children of God and bestows on them the Holy Spirit. May the Lord, who has begun this good work in us, bring it to completion in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Please stand. Glory to God in the highest and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, sin of the world, have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Receive our prayer. For you are the Holy One. You are the Lord. You Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, you know we live in the midst of so many dangers that in our frailty we cannot stand upright. Grant strength and protection to support us in all dangers and carry us through all temptations. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. Jesus is the light of the world. He is the light of the world. He is the light of the world. Jesus is the light of the world, and we will follow him. Jesus is the light of the world. Jesus is the light of the world, he is the light of the world, he is the light of the world. Hallelujah. Jesus is the light of the world, and we will follow him. Jesus is the light of the world. When there is trouble, no need to go astray. He yes, he will shine. Jesus will help you find your way. to be afraid. Yes, he will shine. Jesus will 
will bring a brighter day. The Old Testament reading is from the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 18. Moses said to the people, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers. It is to him you shall listen. Just as you desired of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly, when you said, Let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God, or see this great fire any more, lest I die. And the Lord said to me, They are right in what they have spoken. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. And whoever will not listen to my words that he shall speak in my name, I myself will require it of him. But the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name that I have not commanded him to speak, or who speaks in the name of other gods, that same prophet shall die. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. The epistle readings from the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 8. Concerning food offered to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. This knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. If anyone imagines that he knows something, he does not yet know as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, he is known by God. Therefore, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that an idol has no real existence, and that there is no God but one. For although there may be so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, Yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. However, not all possess this knowledge, but some, through former association with idols, eat food as really offered to an idol, and their conscience, being weak, is defiled. Food will not commend us to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat, and no better off if we do. But take care that this right of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if anyone sees you who have knowledge eating in an idol's temple, will he not be encouraged, if his conscience is weak, to eat food offered to idols? And so by your knowledge, this weak person is destroyed, the brother from whom Christ died. Therefore, sinning against your brothers and wounding their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never eat meat, lest I make my brother stumble. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. 
At this time, we invite our children to come forward for a children's message. Well, good morning, boys and girls. How are you doing today? Do you like that sunshine? That's great. Okay, I have a question for you. How come you're here today? Why are you here today? Does anybody know? Because it's church day? Okay, what else? What happens on church day? We learn about God, absolutely. So I am very happy that your parents or your grandparents brought you today. Why did they bring you here today? Because they want you to learn more about who? About God and about his son, Jesus. That's right. Well, did you know that Jesus went to church every week too? Did you know that? Jesus went to church, and you know what he did at the church? He was like our pastors. He got up and, and told people more about God because he wanted everyone to know about him and his Father in heaven. Well, one day Jesus was in church, and he was busy teaching the people, and a man came in who was very sick, and no one could help this poor man. He was so sick. And so Jesus did a miracle. Do you know what a miracle is? It's something Jesus can do that no one else can do. So Jesus did a miracle, and he made the man well. The people were so amazed. Here was this man who no one could help, and Jesus made him well. And so the people were very excited. And when they left church, they went and they told everyone about Jesus. And they said, he is so amazing. So when you guys come here to church and you listen to the song in the choir and you listen to the pastors and you listen to your Sunday school teacher and you listen to your parents read the Bible, you're learning more about Jesus. So Jesus wants you to learn about him every day and go and tell other people. Can you do that? Can you tell other people about Jesus? Okay. And I hope to see you again next Sunday in church. Will you fold your hands and we'll say a prayer? Dear Jesus, Dear Jesus. thank you for giving us your words in the Bible. Help us to listen to the words. And to love Jesus more and more every day. Amen. Please stand for the reading of the Holy Gospel as we sing the Alleluia in verse. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the first chapter. Jesus and his disciples went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath, Jesus entered the synagogue and was teaching. And they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught as one who had authority, and not as the scribes. And immediately there was there in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent, come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying out with a loud voice, 
came out of him. And they were all amazed, so that they questioned among themselves, saying, What is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. And at once his fame spread everywhere throughout all the surrounding region of Galilee. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise Praise to you, O Christ. We sing the hymn of the day. Jesus, thank you so much for this day, this moment, for gathering us here because you are here. May your Holy Spirit so convince, so overwhelm us with the truth and your love. Lord, let no one here miss your gift of life with you. In your name we pray, amen. You may be seated. Knowledge puffs us up because we're just so full of knowledge. We, we know stuff. And it gives us the authority to teach, to lead, and to do things with our knowledge. 
medical doctor will receive her license once she has proven that she knows the medical arts and can perform them. But not just her. Teachers, cosmetologists, pastors. Once we have proven that we know what we're doing, then we're allowed to perform our duties on the public. Because no one wants their hair colored by a cosmetologist that just doesn't know what he's doing with the chemicals, right? Who knows what color it'll end up? Yeah. And, and it's just there that we find that we know things. And, and having known things, because you've passed the bar exam, and now you're a lawyer, or the CPA exams, and now you're an accountant, or whatever your program, be it technical school, a college degree, or a doctorate, there we now have received all of the information to begin the practice of our profession. And it does fill us up with a certain amount of, well, I know things, and, and when we see things that aren't the way they should be, we feel the need to say something, right? You know, especially in our own profession. Like, the worst job for a pastor is to preach in front of pastors. Like, if you're in a room full of pastors, oh my, because they all know how it should go, how everything should happen, right? And, and that's just kind of how we are when we see people in our profession doing things that aren't quite right. You know, you, you've had the plumber over to your house after you've tried a little something, you know, you watched a few YouTube videos. I can do this, right? And then you couldn't, and then the plumber comes, and he knows all of the city codes, and he just takes a look at what you've done and kind of shakes his head. You know, this, this, this isn't going to work. You've got a backflow here. It's going to smell. You've got the fittings aren't right. And he kind of gives you a little lecture, right? You know, in a nice way, because you're paying him, but still, he gives you a lecture of what the code is supposed to be like. And you know, and it, it is not just that things won't work right. You can actually hurt people. Because, yes, you can wire your own house. But it may burn down because you just don't understand the, that this is a 15-amp line. You can't put 30 amps through it. It's going to start on fire. And, and, and it might be big stuff like your house, but it also might be little stuff. You just get sick. You know, the, the school uh, lunch lady... She knows about the proper food handling techniques, and her food handler's card tingles a little bit when she sees the potato salad at the family picnic left out just a little too long. And, and she might get a little puffed up, a little in your face about what we're going to do with the potato salad now. It's got to be thrown out because she knows what grows in mayonnaise that's a little too warm for a little too long. You know, we all have knowledge, and it puffs us up, and it informs us what is right and wrong, and, and we want to protect people and help people, and, and that's what we want to do with our knowledge. And it's very helpful in most instances when we're performing our duties. But do you know where it's not very helpful? Interpersonal relationships. Your friendships. When you tell your friends what should be done and not done. How does it work in marriage when you know best? And, and, and in the congregation. Oh, this we are ripe for knowing things, especially in a Lutheran church, because we really know our doctrines. We care about our doctrines. And when we see doctrines that aren't happening the way they're supposed to, we feel compelled to tell people, you're not right. And perhaps not even in the nicest way. And that's just, uh, that's just the way it is. And well, it's certainly how it was in the congregation that Paul started in Corinth. And as he hears about all the mess that's going on, this is one of the many things that wasn't right in his congregation. And so he has to tell them, hey, hey, I know we all have knowledge, but you know what knowledge does. It just naturally builds us up, puffs us up, and then we got to tell people what we know. Okay, I get that. That's how it works. But you don't know the way you should know and ought to know if your knowledge is being used to hurt people. Now, this is really tough in congregational life because, I mean, we see stuff and we need to say stuff. And, and, but then the care of people doesn't always happen. And so Paul has to kind of double down, and he says, yeah, we all know. And, and I agree with you. You know the right things about idols. 
you who are strong in your faith and in your doctrine. See, you know that an idol is nothing. You know that there's only one God and one Lord Jesus. And you know that you can eat any meat. You can even parade yourself right into the old idol's temple because that's where the meat was. Sit down there and, and just have a good meal. Um, but not everyone in your congregation has the maturity of that knowledge. Some people are still weak in their knowledge. They don't know everything. And so, because they don't know, well, we're going to, we're going to sacrifice for them. Now, that does not set well at all with us. What do you mean? Now, hang on. Paul's not asking you to sacrifice your convictions. He's not asking you to sacrifice what you know in your doctrines. But he is asking that we make a sacrifice for those who do not know, who are weak in their understanding and in their faith. And, and so Paul said, well... I, if it's going to make my brother stumble, I just will not eat meat. And there we would think Paul has now laid out a rule for us to follow. And it doesn't sound like a very fun church potluck. No meat, you know. And, and, but, but be careful because Paul has not laid out a rule for us in every specific instance of church life. But he is giving us a specific illustration. This is what it looks like to... Love your weak neighbor. And if the situation had been different, the circumstances uh, much different, then his illustration would have been different. And we have examples of this from Paul in the New Testament. Why, just think about what he did with circumcision. Remember, the, the Jewish laws demanded that if you're going to be part of God's family, you must be circumcised. And that's how it was from Abraham until Jesus. But now when Jesus has come, he has fulfilled the law. Everything. Now we have been set free to be his people without any regulations. They've all been nailed to the cross, fulfilled in Jesus. And now the way into God's family is through faith, which you receive in your baptism. And Paul was very adamant that if you are circumcised, then Christ is of no value to you. And he got very specific and very graphic in his letter to the Galatians. As he just throws his hands in the air and says, who has bewitched you? Who has, who has so befuddled you? And those who demand to be sacrificed, and he gets very graphic, I wish you'd just go and cut everything off. That's how strong Paul thought about circumcision and that it is no longer needed it is now everything about Christ so you would think that that would be the case in every case uh-huh open up your bible well not right now but maybe later open up your bible to acts chapter 16 and you'll hear a very curious episode of Paul and a young pastor named Timothy as in first and second Timothy in the bible and as Timothy is accompanying Paul on his journeys of sharing the gospel, we learn that Timothy had a Jewish mother and a Greek father, which meant he was not circumcised. And they're going into all the Jewish areas, and Paul wants to take Timothy along. And so he, here's the deal, Timothy. Um, you're going to need to be circumcised. What? Yeah, I know. We don't want to cause a stumbling block for the people we're trying to share Jesus with. And so Timothy agreed to be circumcised. He sacrificed his own comfort so not to be a stumbling block to the other. And Paul, did he, did he sacrifice his convictions? Did he sacrifice his doctrine? No, he made a, a difference for those who will hear the gospel. That's messy, isn't it? I mean, it's not a clear, we love a clear-cut, tidy rule. This is the rule you follow all the time, every time, without exception. And instead, we've been given a call to love our neighbor every time, all the time. And it's messy because how do you do that? Because there really is a right and a wrong. There really is the doctrines of the church. And, and yet, they are as important as they are, people are just as important how do you know when to eat meat? How do you know when to take a stand? Like, no, we're going to eat meat right now. How do you know when to do that? 
Well, fortunately, we have a place to go to and see how knowledge, which puffs you up and demands compliance, and love for people are both done at the same time without contradiction and without any conflict. And they're, they're expressed to their fullest. And that place is the cross of Jesus. And there, at the cross, the crucifixion of Jesus, we have a lens to which we might be able to fully see the weak as the ones for whom Christ died. We see just how much Jesus loves people, not just any people, but those who are boneheaded, wrongheaded, believe in all kinds of crazy things headed, people who have doctrines that are just totally messed up, people who are immoral, people who are evil and sinful. We see how Jesus looks at them. I love them, the weak, this much, that I will not only sacrifice my convenience, not only pain, but my life for them. But what about the knowledge that they're wrong? Jesus then sacrifices himself in payment. All of their wrong is taken in his responsibility. The Holy Spirit will lead you to know as you ought to know in this congregational life of how to treat one another when he leads you to this confession. And I too am weak. I too am one whom Christ has died for. It is in this weakness that the Holy Spirit it strengthens us to care for one another and to sacrifice for them in their weaknesses as we have weaknesses too so that we might truly love and care for one another even when we are boneheaded, even when we've done the wrong thing, even when our politics isn't yours. To truly love one another because we're looking at one another through the lens of the cross, and I there am one who is weak that Christ has died for. So why would Paul then voluntarily give up eating meat? Because of the Spirit-led question in his own heart as he wondered, well, how can I love and stay connected to my fellow followers of Jesus? Because I can't just cut them off. I can't just shun them and not be around them. I can't just condemn and then walk away. I actually have to live with these people because I'm going to be seeing them for all eternity, right? They're, they're those for whom Christ has died. It would be kind of embarrassing in heaven to run into them if I've been so mean to them here. And so we're going to do it now with the love and the grace and the power of him who has been raised from the dead. Yeah, it's messy. But look, God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit has chosen to come join us in the mess. And to lead us in loving one another in this congregation with the people that you're looking at right now. All glory and honor to Jesus as we, the weak ones, look to him for such strength. Amen. I invite you to join with me in confessing our faith. Together we confess, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. At this time we worship our Lord. We bring forward our tithes and our offerings along with attendance cards, both from visitors and guests alike.
We bring them forward in our act of worship to the plates before you. Please stand for prayer. We pray, O Lord, we give you thanks for every member of our Ascension congregation, and we pray that you would lead us in the messy work of, living, of loving each other in truth and grace. Keep our hearts from bitterness against those who are weak, and may we each be led by the Holy Spirit to care for one another. Lord, in your mercy, Dear Jesus, we pray for all congregations who are seeking to call pastors and other church workers. Give discernment to our call committee of ascension as we begin the work again of calling a maple site pastor. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son cast out unclean spirits and taught with authority. He is the great physician of body and soul. Have mercy on those who are sick distressed, or in, da in danger, or facing any need. We especially pray for Dan Brzezinski, Larry and Joyce Detweiler, Gina Harnden, Leon Lungwitz, Sam Maurer, Scott Roberts, and Bud Ollander. We also pray for Stan Wilson family at the death of his mother, Jesse. Sustain them with patience, trusting in your merciful care, and graciously relieve them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord of hope, guard and keep all who face the temptations of the devil, the world, and our sinful flesh, and preserve the faith of those troubled by doubts. Through the daily remembrance of our baptism, enable us to win the victory over all that threatens our faith. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O Lord, Heavenly Father, we gratefully remember the sufferings and death of your Son, Jesus Christ, for our salvation. Rejoicing in his victorious resurrection from the dead, we draw strength from his ascension before you, where he ever stands for us as our own high priest. Graciously receive our prayers, deliver and preserve us, for to you alone we give all glory, honor, and worship, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Taught by our Lord and trusting his promises, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen.